Reliance on a static image in a dynamic environment can make nodule biopsies using lung navigation technology challenging. You need confidence throughout the procedure to know where you're at and that you're on target. Introducing Illumisight, the first system that puts the power of precision in your hands. CT to body divergence is a challenge because it's really keeping our physicians away from the ultimate success that they can have in a procedure. There's a myriad of reasons why it occurs. Um, one being, you know, we're going from a static environment when the patient receives the CT scan prior to procedure to a dynamic environment when they're on the table during the procedure. We also know that patients face anesthesia challenges. Thirdly, as we're putting that bronchoscope down on that airway, that tissue distortion happens. And we were really trying to focus in on what are the biggest challenges and how we solve for them. When I think of Illumisite, I think really about the next generation of our company and how Medtronic is innovating in the lung health space. Fluoroscopic navigation enhances visibility of the lesions and gives us alignment to the target. Until today, uh, you know, navigation systems rely on using a virtual roadmap to help us get to the nodule. What we did with fluoroscopic navigation is we said, hey, there's a C-arm over here. Let's take that C-arm and let's rotate it around the patient. Let's take that two-dimensional data. Let's build a three-dimensional volume and let's enhance nodules so we know where there are. So if we have the ability to know that we're in the target with a high degree of confidence, that's gonna be impactful for the procedure, for the physicians and the patients. It gives us an opportunity to biopsy see the nodule like we never have before. So continuous guidance gives the user real-time feedback. We embedded a sensor in the distal tip and at the same time we maintained the real estate inside that channel. What that does for the user is it allows them to know where they are with a improved accuracy of what's happening once a biopsy tool is placed down that working channel. We know that most cancers are not homogeneous in nature. So multi-directional sampling gives us the ability to sample not only in the center of the lesion, but to sample all around the lesion. And I think this is pretty exciting. The cross-country transbronchial access tool allows our physicians to go beyond the airways. Not all airways are visualized when we look at a CT scan. And so having the ability to understand that there is an option to go off-road, to go off the airway, to gain access into the parenchyma of the lung is pretty amazing. Now, having the ability to use near real-time imaging, correcting for CT to body divergence, adding continuous guidance, and we have the ability to access lesions beyond the airway, that's really the powerful package that Illumisite brings to the market. I think the exciting part about the data that we're seeing is really giving us confidence that fluoroscopic navigation technology is working. We've seen physicians embark on their own studies and seeing tremendous success. One study in particular saw a 25 point increase in diagnostic yield with the use of fluoroscopic navigation technology. An early study showed us that in 95% of the cases, the virtual target overlapped the actual nodule lesion, and that gives our physicians physicians' confidence that they are where they think they are. Our clinical studies are so important because it's really proving that the technologies that we're bringing to market actually work, and they're providing a benefit far and above what we even thought was possible. This is how you biopsy with confidence. This is how together we lead the way in lung cancer care. This is a new era in lung navigation.
Hello everyone, um, I am Dr. Sri Subramaniam. I'm the Medical Affairs Lead for Lung Health in Europe, Middle East and Africa. I would like to welcome you all today to this discussion on the advances in electromagnetic navigational bronchoscop bronchoscopic technology. Um, I would like to first of all, just go through some housekeeping rules. So um, these are the rules to the webinar today. Um, point to the bottom of your screen. This webinar is being recorded for Medtronic training purposes. And the presentation, but will exclude the chat function and participant list. The video and audio are disabled and you have joined in the listen and view only mode. If you have a question, you can ask a question in the Q&A panel. You can send a message by clicking chat. Do not share any third party personal data, including patient data in your questions or comments. Avoid settings in which others may hear or see your screen. Recording, taking screenshots or photos of screen images is not allowed. There is a brief survey immediately after the webinar. Webinar, Thank you for completing it. And you can leave the meeting at any time at your convenience. Um, I would like to have the first question, please. So we will be interrupting the presentation to ask the audience some questions. Um, so, in order to better understand our audience, please specify your profession, whether that be pulmonologist, thoracic surgeon, radiologist, oncologist, nurse, lab technician, biomedical engineer, trainee or registrar or other. And please specify how many bronchoscopies are performed in your hospital annually. That's zero to 50, 51 to 100, 101 to 250, 251 to 500, or greater than 500. If you could please complete this now, and then we will display the results um, uh, straight after. So the results show that we have on the call today, we have 25% are pulmonologists, 25% thoracic surgeon, and a few registrars, trainees, and a 40% of other. Thank you. Thank you all for joining this Medtronic webinar about the next generation electromagnetic navigational bronchoscopy. As you're aware, navigation bronchoscopy has allowed us to biopsy lung nodules in a minimally invasive way to improve patient safety and by significantly reducing the risk of pneumothorax. The Illumicyte platform provides a solution to a largely unmet need, CT to body divergence. With the Illumicide platform, you have now continuous guidance, which wasn't the case for the Superdimension ENB platform. Navigate has outlined that Superdimension ENB technology is safe and Medtronic has further been building upon that to improve diagnostic yield. Medtronic has worked on Superdimension to improve its performance. It is a pleasure to unveil our new platform, Illumicite, which has a number of new features to make the procedure more accurate. Today, our three guest speakers, Dr. Calvin Lau, Javier Flanders, and Stefan Barat, 
will share their experience using Illumicite. I am very well aware that we are facing an unprecedented situation with COVID-19. However, this webinar will not be addressing those issues. We will be purely focused on the Illumicite EMB platform. I would like to now present to you the three presenters um, and I'd like them to present each other. Um, so if you could present your, each of yourselves. Um, I'll start with Dr. Kelvin Lau. Hello, uh, I'm Kelvin Lau. I'm a um, consultant thoracic surgeon at St. Bartholomew's Hospital in London. And um, uh, my special interest is in navigation bronchoscopy and advanced bronchoscopy. Um, and in particular, using advanced bronchoscopy for ablative therapy, um, which is side by side with my lung cancer resection practice. Thank you, Dr. Lau. And Dr. Javier Flandes from Spain. Hi, I am Javier Flandes from Madrid, Spain. I am a pulmonologist. Uh, I am the director of the most important unit in Spain in the bronchoscopy and IP. I am the president of the Spanish Bronchoscopy and IP. Uh, I have interest in all the interventional procedures in the bronchoscopy. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Flanders. Uh, Dr. Stefan Barrett from Lund, Sweden. Um, hello there, everybody. Stefan Barrett, uh, Lund, Sweden. I'm a, a consultant pulmonologist and uh, work, as you heard, in the interventional unit. Uh, a uh, little unit that we do about 2,000 uh, bronchoscopies a year. Uh, so uh, yeah, our interest in is, is in everything that has to do with intervention. Thank you, Dr. Barrett. So now I'd like to start the um, proceedings with the first presentation of Dr. Lau. Um, Dr. Lau will be presenting for approximately 15 to 20 minutes, and then um, we will have uh, questions to the audience, which as a survey, um, we will move on to the other two presenters, Dr. Flanders and Dr. Barrett, and then have question and answers at right at the end of the presentation. So there won't be any um, discussion during the presentations as such. Thank you. So I hand over to Dr. Lau. Uh, Can I just double check? Can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah. yes. Okay. So, um, well, thank you very much, Sri, and thank you very much, Medtronic, for um, inviting me to talk um, about um, CT body divergence today. Um, we are one of the. Um, uh, we've been very lucky to be one of the units to be selected for the um, the pre um, uh, evaluation of Illumicide, and we certainly found it a very good experience. And I'm going to share with that with you today. Um, so the um, naviga uh, navigation bronchoscopy is a um, is, has a, a attractive prospect for biopsying lung lesions because CT guided biopsy historically causes um, new needle uh, pneumothoraces, and the attraction of doing bronchoscopically is to be able to avoid that. Just like everything else in in medicine, if you could get an endoscope in, things have migrated endoscopically, whether it is in GI, in urology. Uh, uh, and etc. Um, the problem we have in bronchoscopic approach is that when you do your navigation bronchoscopy and you get to this particular scenario, you will think, hey, I've got it. But do you? And we all know that however attractive that is, it's not the case. And in fact, navigation bronchoscopy, I just I simplify it into a very simple concept. It works whenever you can get your tool of your tip to the lesion, but that has an assumption. It assumes you can control the tool of the, the tool, the tip of your tool, and you know precisely where it is. And it assumes that your target lesion, in this case, the green ball, is exactly where the lesion actually is. It's simple conceptually, but the previous generations of um, guided bronchoscopy have not been able to do that. And Illumicide has taken us a step forward in addressing both the tool problem and the lesion problem. So first of 
Well, I'm just going to talk about how Illumicide helps us make the decision and uh, make us, makes us know that the green ball really is where the green ball is. I just want to show you a very dramatic example of one of my navigation bronchoscopy. This gentleman has a, um, a thick ward lesion, a uh, cavitating lesion, and the uh, pulmonologist asked me to biopsy it and grow cultures. So if you, when I do the navigation bronchoscopy, it looks like I, if I stick my needle out, I'm going to be in that cavity. I can wash it. I can biopsy it. But then I do a lot of my, my, my procedures with cone beam CT. So I thought I better check with cone beam CT what it looks like. And here we are. You can see the tip of my catheter, which is at about five o'clock, is completely way off. And if I throw my needle out at that moment, I will end up causing a pneumothorax, but not sampling the lesion. So this is what CT body divergence is, is when the green ball is taken from a pre-existing CT, doesn't match where the lesion actually is, on the day you actually do the procedure because of a variety of reasons. When you do the um, planning for your navigation bronchoscopy, you get the breadcrumb tree like this. And you, if you overlap it with the existing tree, you see that actually there is the, the CT, when the patient has the conventional CT on their old inspiratory breath hole, looks very different from this, the, the airway map when they are sedated or they're anesthetized. And that's the more peripheral you are, you can see the more divergence it is. But interestingly, a lot of nodules are peripheral. So that's where the problem is. An example is this particular small cavitating lesion. It's a metastasis that I uh, have to ablate um, uh, as part of, uh, of um, a treatment for metastasectomy. And uh, when, we, when I did the navigation bronchoscopy, wow, I met the lesion. That was simple. But then I did a cone beam CT and you can see I am miles away from the catheter. And if you, if you look at the, the CT, if we look at the left-hand side CT, you can see there's a lot of atelectasis. It, especially if you look at the left lung posterior, you can see all this atelectasis. And it turned out that my anesthetists have forgotten to put an inspiratory breath hole during the CT. They just switched the ventilator off and not at inspiration. And so whilst I'm at the green ball, the lung is actually much smaller. So the nodule's been pulled towards the lesion and I've gone past it without knowing because the CT from yesterday tells me is further out. When we repeat the CT with the lung inflated, the one on the right, you can see the lesion has moved out. Now if we overlap that image, you can see that actually the, dis the distance the lesion has traveled is two centimeters just between inspiration and expiration. So this is not taken account for when you do your conventional bronchoscopy. You need something to show you where the nodule is when you are doing the bronchoscopy rather than making an assumption about yesterday. The other thing is the nodules move with breathing. And um, here you can see, you know, a, 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 if you look at this nodule where the arrow is pointing at, a, a eight millimeter nodule can easily move its diameter or more than its diameter. So you will completely lose your, your, uh, your position if you make the assumption that the lesion is where it is when you're fully inspired. And then of course, the next thing is the lung is, is a plastic structure. So as soon as you put your catheter in, it moves everything around. It wants to straighten everything. So you can see the lesion where it, is, it, it was before the catheter put in is blue. But as soon as you put the catheter in, it draws the lung down and so the lesion has moved. So the green ball, which is where the blue is, is no longer there. Your lesion has displaced. So how do people solve the problem of not knowing where the lesion is precisely at the moment uh, they do it? They use several methods. They use fluoroscopy. But the problem with fluoroscopy is you can't see a lot of the lesions, especially the small ones I've shown you. So one of the things that Illumicide does that help you see lesions effectively bronchoscopically without using, without using a cone beam CT is to use the C-arm like a cone beam CT. So it uses the C-arm, it draws, it, it, it makes a revolution and do this limited um, 50 degree um, um, spin to get tomosynthesis, like a mini CT. And you can see, this is what happens. So rather than expensive cone beam CT, I have Chelsea, who is the cone beam CT <laughs> for this case. It is a relatively straightforward fluor fluoros fluoroscopy. And at the end of the procedure, you will see this tiny lesion, which you cannot see on fluoroscopy.
And you can see on the left-hand side is a typical fluoroscopic image. And even when the fluoroscopy shows the lesion vaguely, compare it to the tomosynthesis on the right, it is barn door. You can see exactly where that lesion is. It gives you a lot more confidence. You could see um, that the moment of biopsy. Is, if it's behind the, um, the abdomen in the base of the lung, does that affect you? No, this tomosynthesis is so powerful, you could also resolve a small nodule at the base of the lung. And this is one of the nodules we biopsied. And what happens when you do the tomosynthesis you, uh, uh, and correct it? So here you can see, this is my navigated position of, uh, uh, to the nodule. And, um, and then I corrected it and you can switch on the correction and you see, oh, suddenly I'm actually much more in aligned with the lesion than I thought I was. If I didn't know that and I was on the left-hand side lesion, I would be keeping trying to navigate and, and move it, but actually I'm there already. And vice versa, here is an example where I'm at the lesion and I thought, I'll just go and biopsy it. You do the, tomo, you do the, um, the, the floral nav and then you check your position. Actually, you're not where you are and you need to readjust your position. And then the, so that's correcting for the lesion. The next problem you have is where is your tip? Because at the moment, what we do is once you've decided where you are, you take your locatable guide out and you biopsy. Well, that's a bit like flying a plane with your autopilot and then switching off your autopilot just as you land and, uh, um, and you can't see out your windscreen. Well, you wouldn't do that if you're, if you're flying a plane. So why would you take out your, your GPS just at the moment you want to biopsy, which is the most crucial moment of the whole procedure? If you look at the biopsy instrument here, during the, the, the biopsy instrument, you can you see the, the, um, the wide trajectory of movement of this? Look at that. You, you, you need to know exactly where your biopsy forceps are at the moment of your biopsy. And that is the second half of how Illumicide helps us. It shows you it's got real-time continuous guidance because now there are sensors in the extended working channel. So rather than taking the LG out and losing your position, your extended cha channel will tell you where your, where your tip is and, and the moment of biopsy. So here it is um, with your correction. And then here is your view when you're doing your biopsy. So you could see your biopsy forceps are just getting the edge of the lesion and you might have to adjust the position. Equally, the other thing you can do here, you can see that when you're aligned, actually you, you, you need to readjust your position or you want to sample different areas of the tumor in case part of it you miss. So you can sample a bit here and then you can rotate it and in real time, you can check where your biopsy position is and then change and have multiple site sampling. So I'm just going to briefly describe to you our evaluation. We did it over two months at the beginning of the year, and we did 31 cases. And um, the, in half of those cases, I did the complete sequence with fluoronav, that's the, the tomosynthesis, followed by using the continuous guidance. In the second half of the series, I used cone beam CT to see how it compares to my experience with cone beam CT alone. So just for the fluoronav cases, we did, um, um, 14 biopsies. Um, there were 17 cases. Three of them were, were marking for VATS, uh, for image guided VATS. But for the 14 cases, the mean procedure time is 41. Actually, that's a lot shorter than my navigation bronchoscopy with cone beam CT. Mean size of the lesion is about two centimeters. And in 64%, we had a malignant diagnosis. And with one of those, there were atypical cells, which are highly suspicious. Um, but I count that as not diagnostic. So if you look at that, the yield is 64%. The other 23 pa patients I did with cone beam CT. So I used the continuous guidance and then check my position. The mean size is 25 millimeters and I had a diagnostic yield with 82%. There were four cases, three were non-diagnostic and gained one with, di uh, one with atypical cells. Now, it's very difficult for me to help you interpret what these numbers mean. So I put it into context because uh, two years ago, we presented in EACS our experience of starting cone beam CT. And you can see on the cone beam CT alone, our yield is about 50%. And if we add a cone beam CT, we get up to 70%. So, how does Illumicide fit into that? Well, Illumicide without cone beam CT is better than the old navigation bronchoscopy. And Illumicide with cone beam CT is better than my navigation bronchoscopy with cone beam CT. So it has enhanced 
the navigation and the accuracy of my biopsies. Now, one thing I haven't shown here, um, because the data is not out yet, is that is significantly, for the cone beam CT, it significantly reduced my time of procedure and my radiation dose. So I think we are moving very quickly along to having a system that doesn't require a very expensive cone beam system in-house. In, in so if we go back to our model of of navigation bronchoscopy is really just asking for a tip that you can control and know the exact position and move it precisely at each moment you want and the lesion which you know where it is. Well, navigation bronchoscopy, Illumicite has managed to help solve both of those problems. You will see around there are a lot of other very fanciful um, systems, not fanciful, fancy systems, um, but, you will, but for example, robotic bronchoscopy will only address the tip problem. Yes, it has very, very accurate movement of the tips. You can know precisely where the tip is at any point, but it doesn't address the lesion problem. Equally, cone beam CT and other imaging modalities like uh, Rebus or so on can tell you about the lesion, but they don't address the tip problem, whereas Illumicite addresses both problems. So in summary, CD body divergence, it happens because you as uh, the nodule in the position of the chest during the uh, planning CT is different from when you give the patient an anesthetic or a sedation and then breathing away. And floral nav lets you check the position of this lesion where you cannot, where you can see it in real time in, in the live procedure and then correct your green ball and allows you continuous guidance so you can biopsy that at the right time. And the strength of it is you can see all sorts of lesions that you can't see on fluoroscopy. And it's very simple to use your fluoroscope to just add this extra step to it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lau. Um, do we have the second questions for the audience? So, so these are the results from the last. Do you have the second set of questions? Thank you. So um, following Dr. Lau's presentation, um, which complementary technology are you using to overcome CT to body divergence? Um, EBUS, are EBUS, fluoroscopy, or cone beam CT? Um, do we have the next question? Or we can show the results, actually, sorry. So the results are very much in favor of fluoroscopy at 60%. REBUS at 40%, cone beam CT at 30%, and EBUS at 25%. Okay. Thank you. And the next question Your diagnostic yield from bronchoscopy in peripheral lung lesions ranges within less than 25%, 25 to 50%, 51 to 60%. 61 to 70%, 71 to 80%, or greater than 80%. Okay. And the results here show 33%, so one third at 61 to 70%, then closely followed by 51 to 60%, um, and then less than 25% at 19%, 25 to 50% at 10%, and then we have in the higher figures of 71 to 80%, about 10% in total there. Thank you for completing that. Um, 
We will now move on to Dr. Javier Flanders' presentation. And so I'll hand over to Dr. Flanders. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, you can see the presentation, it's okay? Yes, we can see it, thank you. Okay. Uh, the early detection of the solitary pulmonary nodule is one of the capital problems now in our units because after the increasing of the screening programs, we have every day more and more uh, nodules in early stages, and it's crucial the diagnostic for an increase in the survival and decrease the mortality. After the study of Navigate, the, we can see the average of the diagnostic yield of the EMB is about 69% and is an excellent result, but the problem is not enough. As Kelvin explained, one of the major limitations of the EMB is the divergence. And as he explained, uh, is the difference between the CT scan in advance and the situation of the airways during the registration of the patient. And also this problem is most important in the periphery of the lungs. In this slide, you can see the most important variables could, could affect in the accuracy of the procedure, but uh, the most important are the CT scan versus the procedure. And we have the lab volume difference, the telectasis, as the case of Kelvin explained, the difference in the time, also many times increase the, the disease and the stage of the cancer. We have the changes in the, in the muscles because we use for the, in the general anesthesia the blocking agents and also as the problem to introduce a, a tool, a bronchoscope inside the anatomy of the lung. For all these reasons, uh, uh, we could have a important uh, divergence, but the most important probably is the difference in the volume of the air. Also, uh, for this reason, I think it's very important to improve this technique is to perform the CT scan with the patient uh, similar as to be during the procedure. Normally, the CT scan, the patient is with a full inhale, but in this situation during the procedure, the patient is breathing a uh, tidal volume. We suggest to in these patients before the CT scan, uh, make a deep breath, to open the peripheral airway and also perform the CT scan in, in tidal volume, tidal bleeding, and also to cough before to remove the bronchial secretions. The lumicide, of course, is a new technology. And the most important thing is the tomosynthesis between the CR, the fluoroscopy with the CR, and also the EMD. No? Uh, this is our bronchoscopy suite before the procedure and it looks like a little crowd, uh, maybe chaotic, but all is in his own place. We need the fluoroscopy, the main screen to work, the patient in the middle, and also for the side and the bronchoscopy. And it works well. Also, the, it's different, the new model for the side with it change because we have the extended working channel and the sensor cable in the same direction, but in the top is only the locatable guide and the cable. We have a different a working channel shapes, 45 degrees, 90 degrees and 180 degrees, depends. The angulation of the bronchi, we want to introduce the probe. The requirements for this technique I think the, the first and most important is to have experience in EMB. We need a coordinate team and also a first group knowledge for the technician and the proper handling of the samples. Now uh, we can stop to make the question seven. Uh, thank you.
what type of EMB training would you need to be successful? Uh, please, uh, you can select, it's an option multiple. Let's go to see the results. Okay, 67% says that the most important to be successful is the hands-on training and training institute. Okay, I agree. Okay, to close. The timing in the training program proposal is the first is a virtual training, of course, to know the new equipment and know all the tools. The second step is a real cases assisted by experts. The third is the first 10 cases with expert and remote assistance. And the fourth step is 20 real cases by regular team. After these 20 cases, your team has overcome learning curve and it could be independent safety. But as you respond in the question, the main step in training is the, to be assisted in real cases by experts because the virtual training is not enough and all the doctors or the physician with this new technique needs the assistant with experience to the others to correct the mistakes and also to help. I think it's the most important. Also, this technique to be success, we need to work like a team. It's no one work of the doctor, it's a team. And we need a clear communication between all the members. We need to know well the duties of each member of the team. The nurses, they are responsible for the tools management, the patient position, the location pass placement, etc. The anesthesiologist for the sedation and monitoring of the patient, the radiology technician, the control of the fluoroscopy, the residents and fellows assist to the principal doctor, review the medical records, labs and imaging and the senior doctor to perform the EMB and guide all the steps and coordinate the team. We need, when we have the case, it would be examined by experienced bronchoscopies. Um, planning is a key to achieve a success. We recommend to plan the procedure one day in advance because many times we have unexpected problems mainly with the CD record. It's crucial to prepare all the necessary elements that we will need in advance to avoid problems and to decrease the time during the procedure. And also the nurses, they need to make an exact measurement of the tools outside the extended working channel. The local registration, reduce the CT to body divergence and the local registration corrects for up to three centimeters this divergence. We need to make a local registration for each peripheral target. About the procedure, the, the first step is to perform a conventional bronchoscopy a conventional EMP, sorry, as we do always, every day. The, we need, in this case, after that, a fluoroscopy images to integrate in the navigational software. And as Kevin explained, the fluoroscopy images uh, are captured during the rotation of the C arm. We need to rotate the CR 25 degrees to the left to 25 degrees to the right. 
and these images are captured during the CR rotation. After the rotation from various angles, we have a three-dimensional volume. Once we are with the conventional EMB, at least three centimeter distance, we capture fluoroscopic images. And in this moment is the only moment that the breath hold is required for local registration. We need to stop the breathing of the patient only for this about 25 seconds. The physician marks the navigation catheter at the target of the screen. And also this moment the navigation system use the market location to align the city data to the peripheral airways near the target. We need to confirm in the screen the target to the machine, to the software. In this moment, the position of the navigation catheter is updated and the physician adjusts the position to the navigation catheter before biopsy in the direction he prefers. I think one of the excellent uh, um, application or tools we have with this device is the enhancement of the images. We can see the nodule eh, after the enhancement when normally when the normal fluoroscopy is not visible. The, we are aiming in this procedure a safe procedure with control and it's excellent the control we have in all the moments. We avoid the diverse, the divergence. We have a perfect alignment of the tools in front of the target, and we can achieve multidimensional samplings. I think it's very important to know selected tools because depends the stiffness, the hardness of each tool. We can change the angulation, and we can take and we can obtain excellent biopsies in different areas of the tumor of the target. And this video is not in a human, it's in an animal model. Uh, you can see how depends the stiffness of the tool, we obtain different samples. Now with the needle aspiration, is very soft, we can introduce easy in the tumor. But it's important also to see in the right, in the screen, the alignment is perfect. We are in front of the lesion. Now we are obtaining a biopsies with a excellent control in all the moments. The processing of the samples is also crucial because nothing else matters if the samples are not well proceeds. The proceeding depends on the tools used. The sample obtained and the laboratory, we will send the samples. We prefer to take care of all the samples of the not all, all the cells we can obtain. After our experience with Illumicide, I want to show you four tips I think are interesting to share with you. Uh, first is, I think uh, we are very happy because using Illumicide, we are not required to reach completely the nodule when we started with the AMD. Uh, we don't need a big accuracy, only to be near at least two, three centimeters, no more. The second is when we combine, sorry, we, we could combine the real time to the fluoroscopy with the view and in the 3D reconstruction. And then depending both screens, we can select the best position, the best angulation, the best uh, situation to take the samples. We need to know, as I tell you in advance, the stiffness of the tools to change the alignment and obtain better samples and the samples must be done for different angles, directions, and alignment. Now, 
I will show you the eight question. When it comes to EMB as platform technology, you will be using EMB four, and you can choose one of these four answers. The diagnostic outcomes, marking of lesions or surgical resections, marking for ray therapy, or getting ready for future ablative therapies. Please answer and send. Okay. 48% use the EMB for diagnostic outcomes. 34% marking lesion for surgical resections, 3% marking for eye therapy, and 40% getting ready for future ablative therapies. Excellent. The applications, as in the question was, of course, the, the most important uh, is the diagnostic of peripheral nodules, is, but also, is a good tool for select area to take biopsies in the interstitial diseases, and also you can introduce a cryobiopsy unit. Uh, we can use the Illumicide for a treatment planification to place fiducial markets and also die marking for surgical resections. And for the future, I think very early. It could be a peripheral nodule treatment for microwave ablation or radiofrequency ablation. In conclusion, fluoroscopy navigation represents a great step forward in long peripheral nodule diagnostics because eliminate the CT to body divergence is done in real time, very important, and allows to redirect the tools to the real nodule positions in all the times. Second, the training and team building are reliable measures to improve the diagnostic yield. The real cases performed with expert assistance is the most important step in the training program. And the last conclusion, Illumicide enables other possibilities in addition to peripheral nodules and interstitial diseases diagnostics as treatment verification or therapeutic approaches as microwave ablation or radiofrequency ablation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Flanders, for a very informative presentation. Um, we will now move on to Dr. Stefan Barrett's presentation. Um, just to remind everyone, we will be taking question and answers that you can put through the chat um, to me, and I will present them to the panelists. Um, at the end of Dr. Barat's uh, presentation. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Medtronic and Sri, for inviting me for talking about this. Uh, uh, both uh, Calvin and Javier has talked a little bit about uh, uh, the benefits of a continuous uh, navigation, uh, which is uh, one of the features of Illumicide. Uh, I will show you a little bit more about that and uh, um, show you a case which uh, sort of highlights just the benefit. Uh, let's see. Why doesn't this work? All right. Uh, first of all, <laughs> as I said, I work in Skåne. Uh, right now it's uh, sunny and very hot, uh, as in all of Europe, I think. Uh, the section for intervention is. Uh, not that big. Uh, we should be a little bit, maybe a, at least one more senior to, to be able to do all the work we need, but this is how it looks today. We do about 300 EMB cases a year uh, with the super dimension and we tried the Illumicide system and have, has bought it, but hasn't yet really got started with it um, on a daily basis, but it will happen. We all know that uh, this spring has been something else for all of us in, in medicine, uh, as, uh, as you know. 
this is the room that we, we use the, uh, for, for the EMB. Uh, and this is when we use the Olimicite uh, system in the a little bit larger room. Uh, we have a physician and two nurses uh, when we do the procedure, uh, and all of our cases are done in uh, uh, mild sedation. Uh, we don't do any uh, general anesthesia, uh, mainly because that there isn't resources for it, uh, which is sometimes a bit of a challenge, but uh, mainly it, it works quite good. And we have Rose and Rebus uh, along with uh, fluoroscopy. Sometimes we don't do the Rose by ourselves when we have to, but it works that one. It works out well, usually. Um, so this is the case I was talking about. This is a, a male uh, smoker, patient that looks like most of them, uh, as you've seen. He has a, 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 lesion, a lesion in the upper right lobe um, on CT scan, and we did the standardized workup with a PET CT, where you can see the lesion and uh, the uptake. Um, so we started to do the uh, navigation, um, as you have seen, quite easy to get to the lesion. Uh, and. Uh, in this case, uh, of course, uh, trying to do the sampling. But as you can see with, with the system, we thought that we were spot on. Uh, on the uh, uh, rebus though, you can see there is no whatsoever uh, echo that sort of in indicate that you are in a lesion. Uh, this is how it looks on the fluoroscopy uh, with the sort of bent working channel and something that looks like the lesion up here, right? So it looks uh, spot on. Uh, we tried to verify it. Uh, we had to sort of get uh, out and back in again. And then we got the echo, as you can see in the lower, uh, lower right, left here. Uh, when you pull out the probe, then you get the working channel with a continuous navigation on, as you can see here. Uh, it is a little bit away from the target. It doesn't look as spot on, but it's verified uh, with the rebus. So the difference is then, as Calvin said, Calvin said as well, when you put in your instrument, something else happens like this. You get your stiffer instrument to sort of deviate the working channel and you are not in spot anymore. And of course, the stiffer the tool, uh, the harder it is to get to the right place uh, and, and the more deviance you get. This is a video hopefully showing you just what I'm talking about. Uh, this is not the same case, I'd say. This is a case from uh, yesterday where you can see that the this is the uh, uh, rebus probe trying to find any lesion. Uh, I have done the, the uh, uh, navigation and thought that I was spot on. But as you can see up in the upper right, we, I can't find anything that looks like a uh, lesion. Uh, and then I had to sort of pull it out and start it all over. And then uh, you could find it and verify it with your rebus. Uh, and then, of course, you put in your instrument. This time we used the brush at first. And you can see that the brush doesn't deviate the working channel whatsoever. Uh, in this case, we have a uh, rose as well, uh, which uh, uh, can help you to verify if you are in the right pos position before you, you get your biopsy. 
Uh, in this case, we take two samples with a brush, nothing happens. We'll see then what happens when you uh, put in your um, biopsy forceps, which is a little bit stiffer. You can see here you get it and deviates quite a lot, as you can see. I am in a position in about one or two centimeters away from the first one. And if the lesion are, as in this case, not more than one centimeter, then of course you miss it altogether. So in the alumicide system, there is a, a possibility to mark where you are uh, uh, when, when you are doing the, the verification. It's like this, you have a sort of possibility to mark your position. So what you do is that you put in your rebus, you find the best possible place to take your sample and you mark your position. And then you uh, take your instrument, uh, uh, could be your biosip forceps or whatever you use, and then see what happens with the working channel. You can see that I'm not in the same place and I probably won't get any good sampling. But then I can sort of try to mimic the first mark uh, with a working channel while I'll have the instrument inside. Uh, and in that way, I can see it in three dimensions. In that way, I can make sure that I take the sample in exactly the right position, exactly the same position as I had my EBUS verification, like that. So in this case, we found the adenocarcinoma. Uh, this is from the brush and uh, the biopsy, of course, verif uh, verified it. So that's how we can use that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Barat. Um, I'm just going to open it to the, do we have the audience questions? Thank you. So uh, to Dr. Barat, following Dr. Barat's presentation, please specify which tools are used for biopsy. Aspiration needle, cytology single needle brush, cytology triple needle brush, biopsy forceps, gen cut core biopsy system or cryobiopsy. So the majority of those for the biopsy forceps are 82%. Then at 29% is the cytology single needle brush. Um, sorry, then the aspiration needle. So just repeat that. The biopsy forceps are 82%. The aspiration needle at 47%. Then the cytology single needle brush at 29%. The cryobiopsy at 18%. And then the cytology triple needle brush and the gen cut both at six percent here. Thank you. So I will now open the next one is question six on how many samples do you take per nodule? So that's one to five or more than five. So we have a draw at 39% on three and four biopsies. Um, and then we have 17% more than five and 6% at five. So it's between three and four. Well, thank you. 
So I'd like to now open uh, the, uh, the, the webinar to questions and answers. Um, and I'll start off with some questions that I've received uh, through the Q&A. Um, the first one is, uh, thank you for this very useful and informative webinar. I am wondering if compared to CT guided lung biopsies, are there significant differences regarding the size of needle used in ENB compared to CT guided biopsies that could affect the tissue collected under diagnostic accuracy? So could I, would one of you or all of you like to respond? Kelvin or Dr. Flanders, yeah? Yep. Well, I, I want to say in, in, in our hospital, we use both in, when the nodule is in the periphery, we use the, the biopsy with the CT scan, of course, transthoracic biopsy, no? But uh, it doesn't affect, in our experience, the, the size is the same, and also the diagnostic accuracy is the same. The only difference is with the CT scan, uh, biopsy, transthoracic biopsies, we have more pneumothorax. With the EMB, our rate is 4.5%. And with the CT scan, the pneumothorax rate is, uh, total pneumothorax is more than 25%, but that they need to place a chest tube is about 8%. And also, the radiologists, they refuse to, to perform a biopsy in patients with emphysema, with bulla, and for these reasons, uh, if we perform the biopsy with the bronchoscopy, with the EMB, and they don't perform the biopsy. Okay, Kelvin, you want to? Um, so uh, I completely agree, yeah. Um, it's, I, I think it's not quite right to compare the needle in a CT guided biopsy with the needle you use in navigation bronchoscopy. Because as you see, the majority of us use biopsy forceps and pull up chunks of, of material. And because in the, in the core needle, you just fire once and it, it cuts. Whereas in, 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 in navigation bronchoscopy, you can biopsy, you can do your continuous guidance, readjust your position and biopsy. So you get a lot more tissue. That my pathologist tells me they get a lot more tissue. Thank you. Dr. Barat, do you want to respond or share? Uh, yes, I, I totally agree. Uh, we don't usually use any needles uh, doing the ENBs. Uh, we haven't found any really good needle to use, actually. And, and the biopsy forceps is, is enough. I'd say that we use usually three different tools. We use the uh, brush, we use the biopsy forceps, and then we do the suction for cytology uh, at last, before we sort of pull out the, the, uh, um, the working channel. Uh, and that is something that is not costly whatsoever and gives you quite a lot of, of, of cells for, for doing what the pathologist wants to do with it. So that's, that's a tip, never throw that away. Okay, thank you. Um, the second question I have is, what is the main advantage of Illumicide combined with the cone beam CT? Okay, uh, in, uh, also uh, in my hospital, uh, we have both possibilities. I can perform combined CT, and also I have uh, EMB and Illumicide, we started. Uh, for me, the main advantage of the Illumicide is because it's in my bronchoscopy suite. I don't need to go to the OR, and for me, is I am very comfortable working in my own space. This is, for me, is the main advantage. Thank you. Um, for me, I, I do all my, my bronchoscopies in the theatre, so, um, so I'm, I'm quite lucky it, 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 it's, it's a place I'm familiar with. Um, to me, um, there is um, there's a three-step assumption. The green ball, the green ball corrected at the moment of your tomosynthesis, and really at the moment what your biopsy looks like. And for uh, and my 
Yeah. So you saw my series, I did 30 odd cases, but there were a number of cases I did, and especially the therapeutic cases like the ablation, I need to see exactly where the ablation catheter is. I need to see the relationship of the ablation catheter to the lesion, how, how much the margin is in three dimensions. And so that's when I need real-time multiplanar CT. And that's what I think it adds. Nevertheless, I use the whole procedure is much less because the Illumicide gets me much more accurately to the lesion much quicker. And so I don't need to keep doing cone beam CT to readjust my position to get alignment because I'm there already. So it's now become rather than a navigation tool cone beam CT, it becomes a confirmatory tool cone beam CT. Okay, thank you, Dr. Lau. Dr. Barrett? Yeah, well, we, we don't use cone beam CT in, in our hospital, so I, I can't sort of mention anything about that. Uh, but but I, I think that that the uh, that the comments from, from Javier uh, would would be a little bit more like ours because we do bronchoscopy and the bronchoscopies we, we are quite used with the EMB and the fluoroscopy and all of that. So I think it's more more or less what you are comfortable with and, and what works in your sort of setting. Thank you all. Um, the next question I wanted to ask was about the use of moderate sed sedation. So have you witnessed any failure of fluoroscopic navigations since you cannot do a breath hold? I think that would probably be to Dr. Barrett. Well, I say I, we haven't tried it because uh, the uh, the flu fluoroscopy system we have uh, isn't compatible with Illumicide, so I haven't tried it. I don't know. I can't answer that. We have a digital digital one, and you need an analog. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I also uh, the Illumicide is. Oh, I, I, at least in my unit, and I think is is the suggestion for the company is to perform for these reasons under general anesthesia. Uh, in, in my unit, when I perform a illumicide procedure, is always with the anesthesiology to make a breath hold during the moment of the CR uh, sweeping. But for the normal EMB, I use conscious sedation, and it was excellent here. Uh, we have uh, more than 400 uh, EMB procedures with conscious sedations with any problem, and we never use the anesthesiology for, for these procedures. But for the Illumicide, uh, we need, at least I think it's mandatory, uh, general anesthesia. Thank you, Dr. Flanders. Dr. Lau, do you have any comments? Um, I, I, I've been, I, I'm quite lucky being a surgeon because I have an anesthetist in the room. So it is, I don't have to, to, um, to fight for resources to do that. And, um, but I, I, I could imagine that if you have movement, then you're, you will get a very blurry image. Um, uh, and also the continuous guidance will add an extra level of inaccuracy to it. For example, I, I tell you what, when I do a peripheral nodule, say on the diaphragm, that you can see that so much movement, I do it on a breath hold because you, the only time you can trust that green ball is at that one moment of ventilation. And that one moment of in, in the full inspiratory breath hold I can then trust the green ball. I put them in the inspiratory breath and biopsy on apnea. Um, so I think it's very, I, 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 I haven't proved of, haven't got proof of that, but it's good to try to show whether it makes a difference to diagnostic yield. Thank you. Thank you all for, the, for that. Let me move on. Um, to Dr. Barat, uh, do you always include radial EBUS and to the others, how much do you use RE bus? Yes, we, we do that in, in all the cases. Um, I mean, it's there. It doesn't cost you anything extra. So we use it all the time uh, for verification. And, and if, I, if I don't get an, an, an accurate echo uh, that I thought that I would get, then I, I navigate again uh, until I 
get something that looks like an echo. Sometimes you know that we 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 can't get it because uh, of the lesion. Uh, I mean, if if you get right onto a solid lesion and not into it, then you don't get an echo. So sometimes you have to think about, about that as well. But but mainly, it's I don't I don't like to do any bigger biopsies without any any sort of verification. Yeah, no, thank you, Dr. Barrett. Um, just yeah. Okay, in, in, in our unit, now, like uh, Stefan, uh, we use now uh, always the radial ebus. At the beginning, we don't use because we don't believe too much, but now I think it's very helpful. The problem is many times the, the nodule, the target, the lesion is in advance, it's in front, it's ahead. And then the radial ebus, you are, uh, you obtain a diagnostic, but the radial ebus take uh, peripheral uh, imaging it, it, you see is nothing but the but the the, 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 the target the nodule the lesion is uh, ahead and then uh, it's helpful but you need to know also the limitation of the radial ibus. thank you yeah thank you uh, dr Flanders um, I'll move on to the next question uh, with the lumicide do you think the technology can now offer the same diagnostic yield to TTMA. Oh, okay, I want to say that we are talking the different indications because is uh, is different. Uh, we say in Spanish, I don't know, uh, uh, apples and orange is different, no? Because the TNA is uh, the transthoracic needle aspiration is for uh, some uh, nodules are close to the to, to the wall, the chest wall, and also uh, the patients you is excluded patient with emphysema with bullet uh, with another contraindications, and the lumicide and the EMD the indication is for all the cases. Uh, the, the risk of the pneumothorax is very low. And in, I use the transthoracic needle aspiration when I have a nodule close to the, to the chest wall, of course, because it's cheaper and, and it's an excellent tool. But, and it, but I, I, I prefer to use when it's available. But uh, in our institution, uh, we perform, this is, uh, I, I don't exactly, but more or less, uh, we perform a year about uh, 50 uh, EMB procedures and about uh, 100 uh, transthoracic needle aspiration procedures. This is in my hospital, the real uh, situation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Flanders. I have another question uh, directed to Dr. Lab. Dr. La, have you utilized the cross-country tool with continuous guidance yet? And if so, what was your experience? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, so in fact, of the cases that, um, that I did during that period, the ones that I anticipate needing um, uh, cross-country, I use the old super dimension platform. And that's because um, I, Cross country wire to me, you need to have cone beam CT. You need to know where the, where the wire is exactly before you go out and dilate because you don't want to, well, one, you don't want to injure vessels, but two, also, if your needle is not in the right place and you dilate, you create a false track which all your biopsies and further movement will go just fall into. And I don't think that with the tomosynthesis, I cannot see exactly where the needle has advanced out to. So my view um, is that cross country is a cone beam CT instrument. I don't know if others have experience with um, with cross country without cone beam CT. Dr. Flanders, Dr. Brad, do you want to comment or shall I move on? I, I, I have experience with the cross country and I use uh, because I feel safe when I work in the periphery of the lung. If we divide the lung in the 
central area, middle area, and in the in the peripheral area, I feel absolutely safe making horse gas country because there is any important vessel to bleed in. Uh, the only risk is the to make an hemothorax. But if I make it a hole, I do it and I have no problems and I feel comfortable. I don't, Stefan. Oh, I, I haven't I haven't used that actually. Uh, I, but I agree with you. In in the outer part of the lung, there isn't any sort of big risk of doing anything that that could harm a patient like that. Of course, there are freak accidents. There always is. But no, I don't think that should be too too dangerous. No. Okay. So. Um... So the questions have come through and we've answered all that have come through. I have a question from my end in terms of uh, what Dr. Flanders was presenting on training and education, because um, I, I, with the team, we have to develop training and education around EMP. And I wanted to ask you about how you objectively measure competency and proficiency when training. So Dr. Flanders, to, you know how many cases but at the end of the day however good the tool is it's always at the end of the user it's, it's down to the proficiency and the comp competency and of course you three are very high expert users so i would expect you know a hundred percent delivery um, if not close to a hundred percent but when you're training how do you objectively measure because you know we are challenged with that in terms of trying to go towards more simulation in training as opposed to using animals and cadavers? Uh, thank you. It's, it's an excellent question because I participate, I am worried about the, the learning of the techniques and my center is one of the teaching center to, to training. Uh, this question is not easy to answer because the variables are very high and depends uh, for many factors. But for the training uh, in this technique, I think it's mandatory to be at the same time, at least one physician and one nurse. Don't work only with doctors and don't work only with nurses. Uh, I suggest always to be, if it's possible, the same thing. To doctors, to nurses, it's excellent for people, but, and they spend one day uh, with real cases and day training. This is the first idea. The second uh, depends, of course, the experience in bronchoscopy is not the same to perform a 200 bronchoscopy a year than 2000 like Stefan or an I in my unit. Uh, uh, 2000, 200 is not the same. Um, sometimes people with uh, with a few experience in bronchoscopy want to learn complex techniques and they have a problem in the basic of the bronchoscopy. Uh, I, in this case, we need to suggest uh, some improvement, but um, also depends the skills of the physician. So the physicians, they have uh, skills to learn the tips to, to, to catch what happened in the problems, no? Because this technique is not difficult. I think it's the combination of small things. Uh, if you do all the small things correctly, it works well. And it's not complicated. But if someone is not OK, you don't have any results. And for uh, sometimes, uh, here in Spain, I go to another unit to visit when they started with the EMB. And they don't have a success, or they don't have a diagnostic yield enough. And then I need to be. Uh, like uh, TSA and to, 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 to find what happened. No? And sometimes I remember in one hospital in Cartagena, Spain, uh, the problem is uh, they change the, the mattress, the bed, or, uh, after the calibration. And then someone changed the mask and then for this reason don't work. But sometimes are problems of the nurses or, of the, or the physicians or the material. But and after that, of course, I think it's important to 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 give a, 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 a validation. Uh, this this person has the competence, but is sometimes people want to start without 
experience and is a risk for the patients, but I think the success of what one technique depends for the learning curve and it's important to have a learning curve at least uh, supervised by another person with experience. Thank you. Dr. Lau, or Dr. Barrach, any comments or I can... Um, so uh, I, 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 I think um, Javi summarizes that very well. I think the team is so important and we can see that because it only takes, you know, for me, I, I do it in a certain way and then it takes a change of one member of staff who's never done it. And then I have to concentrate in the whole department supporting them rather than thinking about the procedure. Um, so always try to build a team um, so that they can second um, um, uh, guess what you need to do next. And also, I think in my experience, the learning curve was longer than I expected. Or a lot of people say you need to do about 10 cases. I think I really got away from concentrating on the procedure to thinking about the nodule over somewhere between 30 and 50 cases. So don't be disheartened if your diagnostic yield is not good for the first 30 cases. My curve was so flat, I was going to give up. But it will, you, you will be able to do it um, um, when, you, when you understand what's happening in the lung and your, your tools. Yeah, well, I, I totally agree with you both there, um, especially the team thing, of course. And, and I think we all know that when, we, when you started out once with just plain bronchoscopy, it was usually a nurse that learned you how to do it, wasn't it? Uh, a real good one. And you had a, a, a senior behind you who, who wasn't that interested. And, and I mean, that's the way it is. Uh, and it isn't that fair actually to use objectively things like diagnostic yield and stuff like that when you when you sort of uh, start out. Because as you said, it depends on very much about the size of the nodules, the bronchocytes and all of that. The technique itself and not and doing it without harming the equipment or the patient is, I mean, that's maybe 10. And then of course you have to, depends on, on, on the cases, how far, I mean, if, if you only do about five or six centimeters big, uh, big uh, central things uh, to find, then of course you get a yield of 100% quite fast. But I mean, that's not the way it is, is it? Yeah, no, thank you very much. Yeah, I think the emphasis on non-technical skills, having the same team, patient selection, it's, it's really vital. Um, and yeah, I, I see this in a lot of sort of curriculums and and the way we try and focus on training. So yeah, no, thank you very much for that. Um, so if you would like, if you have any comments yourself today, I'd be very happy to, for you to discuss. Otherwise, we're going to start to close the webinar now. Um, so first of all, I'd like to thank all of you graciously for taking up the time, your busy time. I know Kelvin literally just came out of theater um, five minutes before the webinar. So I'd like to thank you all for taking this time on a very hot day here in Europe. Um, and I would like to close with two points. Um, one is that we have a Medtronic COVID brochure that I need to just share and show everyone. Um, just because we are in the middle of this unprecedented COVID situation, um, just to share that with everyone. And also, I'd be glad if everyone could also complete the feedback form and not just sign off so that we can improve the way we conduct webinars going forward. So the feedback is essential for people like me to be able to keep these, these going and, and how we could improve how we use this technology because thanks to COVID, I've done, as you can imagine, we've all done our work through the laptop these last three, four months. And um, it's obviously a tool that's not gonna go away very quickly. So yeah, I again would like to very graciously thank Dr. Kelvin Lau from London, from St. Barts, Dr. Javier Flanders from Madrid in Spain and Dr. Stefan Barat from Lund in Sweden. Thank you very much. And the document being presented was a COVID-19 document just to uh, 
show you all that Medtronic are focused on the safety within theatre in terms of screening laparoscopic surgery, filtration during laparoscopy, and the management of COVID-19 cases. So we are working on different brochures to try and support patients and hospitals and institutions alike. Thank you all, and I hope you have a really good rest of the evening. Please complete the feedback form, and I wish you all a good rest of the week and weekend. Thank you. Thank you, good night.